Why is it on the only day I have to film, it has to be cloudy and rainy? Why? Hi guys, my name is Bobby, and today I'm going to be reading one-star reviews of my favorite books. Now, I've seen this going around booktube quite a bit, and it's kind of fun to watch, because everybody has their own favorite books and their own feelings on them, and I know for me, like, my five-star books that are, like, my favorites, like, you have an emotional, emotional attachment to them, so hearing people trash on them tends to, like, excite some not-so-good emotion. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to do. I have four of my favorite books, ones that'll probably hurt me the most to read bad reviews on. So let's get into it. So the first book that I'm going to read one star reviews on is Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. And my shiny pretty new edition that I spent way too much money on because I needed a full matching hardcover set. No, I don't have a problem. But this will be interesting because this is kind of a polarizing book. So we'll see. I'm going to set it down and pick up my phone and take a look at Goodreads. So first of all, it doesn't have very many one star reviews. 281 out of... 23,809. So I'd say most people love this book, just like I do. Okay, let's see what this person says. Alas, mixed with uh, for 12 to 14 year old girls, Red Sister is probably a four to five star book. For their grannies, historians or not, it just falls flat. Okay, first of all, Red Sister should never be read by like 12 year olds. 14 maybe, but the level of violence and like sexual violence, there's some sexual violence and stuff like no no young no middle grade readers should not be reading this book at all so first off you're wrong about that this is an adult book um the feeling i had after reading this was the author apparently wrote the book solely with the intention of it becoming a great movie property not really like i i can't i guess it could be made into a movie but the way the trilogy is like it would be a very expensive one like game of thrones status like with some of the magical things that happen like there is no way a regular budgeted movie you just couldn't do it and I and the way the trilogy is like you have to do three separate movies or like do the Harry Potter and split it up because there you'd have to leave too much out like no this girl is like Athena's fucked up she has no idea what the fuck she's talking about okay so it has a lot going for it at first glance drama build up good dialogue and scene setting fascinatingly weird world with a hefty doll of a strangely structured society and it's as girl-centric as the vast majority of science fiction fantasy has been male-centric. True. All of this makes me long to give it a better rating. Unfortunately, there's no meat on these promising bones. This emperor is buck naked. What the fuck are you even talking about? Uh, the characters are cardboard with little motivation for most of their actions. Bad guys are irredeemably bad, and good guys are good no matter what they do, and the whole thing reads more like a script treatment than an actual novel. No because uh, there's a lot of good people who do a lot of bad things and they're called out on it so you're wrong oh here's she made a list of problems let's see this is set primarily in a convent yes there's no actual religion happening anywhere outside a couple i've got to go insert religiously sounding class here statements but there's a mysterious holy of holies because convents equals drama yeah right not true there is holy stuff going on they just he doesn't focus on it. it's not like they go to church the way they're the religion works is a little different. Apparently she didn't understand the religion. I'm going with that. She didn't know, she didn't fucking get the religion, obviously. Because there's a whole class of people called Holy Sisters. And if you get to the third book, Holy Sister, there's a whole part about that where the Holy Sisters, like most of the day, they spend praying when they're not doing chores. So, no. The common teaches fighting skills. Yes, Grasshopper Lawrence just lift you right out of China and make you a girl and think you get away with it. Yet, by the admission of the fighting teacher, the skills taught are so rigid that they cannot adapt to other techniques. These students get their asses handed to them by the logical gladiatorial, gladiatorial students, and they somehow turn out legendary fighters. I'm like, what? She's, oh my god. Yeah, no, she, she's acting like he's drawing on history and doing all this. It's a fucking fantasy. It's not a historical fiction. It's not based in Chinese lore. It's a fucking made-up fantasy world. Oh, my God. All right. Okay. Eric gave it one star. Oh, he put spoilers in there. He pretty much just trashes on the writing and the writing style and that the fact that it's all about a girl. So it can't be about a girl? Oh, saying that most this book wouldn't get past a 10th grade English teacher. And then, let's see, he says there's no plot. It's the simplest grade one kindergarten handicap fantasy plot you can use and get, and he screwed it up. He said, this book is a trap. It's complete garbage. Do not purchase it. Goodbye. 
you obviously have no idea. And he read the author's past works and loved them, but didn't like this one. His two past novels, or trilogies, I believe, are centered around a man. Coincidence? I think not. Oh, Elizabeth DNF'd it at 52%. And she is not a DNF'er. At first I tried this book in ebook version and switched over to audiobook because the book dragged for me too much. It actually really didn't help. This book was so boring for me and just went on and on and on. It's not that there weren't things happening, it's just the book was extremely slow for me and I just couldn't take it anymore. And also I found it really confusing and not quite sure what even was going on. First book that I've read for this author, and even though I couldn't stand this book, I'll give other books time a try. But not continue in the series. Okay, I can give her that a little bit. To me, the book wasn't slow, but book one is a lot of setup. I mean, you're setting it up for the whole entire, for the trilogy. So there is a lot of setup, and I can understand where the world building can be a little bit confusing in the beginning. I can see that. I can give her that because you've got the four bloods and how they all fit in and what their specialties are and like, so I got it. I mean, it's pretty explained. There is a glossary in the front or the back of Red Sister for you to reference. So like, it, I mean, the tools are there, but you have to be a good a fantasy reader and not a YA fantasy reader because YA fantasy is usually so basic bitch that you don't need a glossary to figure out like how this world is structured and the world building is usually minimal. So probably going to get hate for that, but it's true. And so I, I, I get that. Like if you're used to YA fantasy and you're reading an adult fantasy and you're not used to the big strict world building where it's a lot complicated, I'll give her that. Um, it's To me it wasn't slow. It's just a world building and character building. There's not a lot of action in book one until the end. So, I mean, I, I can see that. Next we're going to move on to Nevernight by Jay Kristoff. This series is like one of my favorite series of all time. I seriously can't fucking wait until we get Dark Dawn. <sighs> I'm scared. I'm scared to look. I know, I you know what, I think I'm going to guess. I already know what the shit is going to be said about this one. It's going to be all about how they hate the footnotes. It's all going to be about the opening scene, because the opening scene is, uh, is uh, an unusual one. I mean, even the first sentence of Nevernight, like, I think it's in the prologue. Yeah, okay, so in the prologue, the first sentence is, people often shit themselves when they die. I mean, when a book opens like that, it, it, my precious, my precious baby. Uh, so yeah, I know that people are going to bitch about the footnotes. People are going to bitch about the opening scene. People are going to bitch about how hard it is to get into because it really doesn't pick up till after 100 pages. So let's take a look. So there are 23,624 ratings on Goodreads, averages of 4.32. So not too bad. And there doesn't look to be many one star, but we're going to take a look. Oh, one of the people I follow on Goodreads, Emily May. She's very, she's got a huge following. She's kind of like level of like Mel to the any with people following her reviews. And she reviews a lot of books and reads kind of all over the place. She rated it one star. And I love a lot of her reviews, but, and hers is probably really in depth. Oh, she DNF'd it. She said it was a nightmare. She was bored. I had to go read the blurb to remind myself what the book was about. So difficult to get through that I get to the point where I was just counting the pages till I could return to Tana French, who I fucking hate. I do not like Tana French. She is one of the worst writers in the fucking world. So that kind of shows the difference right there. I cannot stand her books. I actually picked her up because of Emily May, and I read, what was it, Into the Woods, the first book in her Dublin Murder Squad. One of the worst books I've ever read. It was so boring. It dragged forever. The mystery was stupid. It was just fucking dumb. So... That tells you right there. She likes Tana French, but doesn't like Jay's writing. Like, there it is right there. She said Ulysses is easier to read than this book. Wrong. Because I would never be able to get through U Ulysses, for sure. Oh, she says it reminds her of Shatter Me, which I've never read Shatter Me, but I've heard it's trash. Um, or a denser version. Uh, she said Shatter Me was not a novel. It was a collection of similes and metaphors that do not make sense. That is a fa fantastic description for this book. Not true. I'm assuming she DNF'd before she got past the 100 page mark because there isn't, I mean, there is a lot of similes and metaphors. It's just, it's kind of Jay's writing, but not really because it's, uh, ugh. it's heavy, lots of description, overuses similes and metaphors. Kind of. Everything is overwritten and melodramatic. No, like, I'm saying, okay, no. No, you're wrong. Sorry. Let's see. Oh, Con. She is 
she has a lot a big following on Goodreads as well. She also said that there was overwrought metaphors and criminal use of adjectives. Um and talked about the beginning scene that she doesn't really understand. The plot is convoluted and barely detectable between the clusterfuckery of purple prose. No, because as the book goes on, there isn't that much purple prose. It's just in the beginning when he's setting up the world and, like, how the world is. The rest of it doesn't have purple prose. Like, I swear to God. And the plot is not convoluted. It's fucking awesome. You just gotta read it. Trust me, it get, took me three tries to get through the first hundred pages. Like, I get it. Yeah, God, most of these. Lola, like, is another one-star review. Um, written in a painful way. Didn't like the reading experience. Writing is so thick. Too much description. It's so-called world building that we're introduced to is overshadowed by the horrendous writing style full of figures of style I wanted to smother more than deck decoratate. And the heroine. Oh, thinks the heroine is a demon. Mia Corvier may be a demon. Like, I'm not... <laughs> that, that might be possible. She's awful. Any semblance of emotion that she may have been able to make her body feel in the past is, is gone and now only darkness slithers her skin. It's true. I... It's true. That should have made me love her. It should have. Alas, I feel no connection to her whatsoever and couldn't even cheer her on her killings, which I'm usually glad to do for anti-heroes. Oh, and she DNF'd it. So there it is. Like, you didn't finish it. And I think that's what a lot of the people have the problem with Nevernight, is that they DNF it before they hit 100 pages going, oh my god, the descriptions are so bad, or oh, blah, blah. If you just get past those 100 pages, like... It's like the purple prose kind of slows the way, way the fuck down and kind of drops off, and then it really takes off. But there is a lot of description and world building. This world is really complex. There's a lot going on. Mia is a very complex character. She's had a lot happen to her. It's just... Give it a try, guys. Like, you just have to give it a try. Oh, now this is somebody bitching about the rep. Let's see what it says. Update. Because it seems that Nevernight wasn't shitty enough as it was, it also shows problematic rep for Maori. Please really read somebody's brilliant post about it. What's... What are they talking about? Oh, and look, not found, so it must have been removed. Oh, 42% DNF'd. See, like, you're not... Mm. Reading this book felt like doing homework. Another DNF at 40%. Yeah, everybody is... It's like DNF, DNF, DNF. Most of the one stars are DNF. Stop reading on page 52... Yep, you guys didn't even finish it, so you have no room to fucking talk or say that it's one star. You guys can kick rocks. Nevernight is a fucking genius trilogy, and it is absolutely amazing, and those people are wrong. The next book I'm going to read one star reviews on is The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne. Read this in April. Absolutely fucking loved it. One of the best books I've read in a long, long time, and I'm curious to see what the one star reviews are. I'm assuming it's going to it's going to be comments about that it's a very gay book. Um, there isn't many problematic things in here. I mean, it talks about stuff that actually happened. So to me, that's not problematic. It's history almost. So I'm curious. There are 40,959 ratings with an average rating of 4.47. So it's obviously very, very good. And the one star seem to be small. So most people tend to love this book. DNF'd book halfway through, Cresta. Why'd you do that for the writing is excellent, and the characterization of Civil Avery was flawless, okay, but it was just too foul. Vulgar, disrespectfully vulgar, and I'm not prude, I swear, but come on. I found this book to be an absolute political tripe that was offensive to Ireland, homosexuality, politics, and religion. If it says Boyle took all of his personal agendas and crammed them into one story, I have so many questions. Okay, possibly, but Ireland was fucking like that. Ireland was is still a very Catholic country. In the 40s, in the 50s and 60s, it was so staunchly Catholic. This shit happened. People were kicked out and told, bye. Doesn't matter if they were raped or whatever. If you were pregnant outside of marriage, you were treated like shit. And they treated gays the same way. Like, homosexuality was a sin. Like, it was punishable by death in Ireland for a very long time. Look it up. It Like, it's not being vulgar or pushing an agenda. It's fucking fact. Like... Sorry, it's fact. Like, it is not... And the way, yeah, it, the way he wrote it was kind of vulgar, but that's how it fucking happened. It was meant to make you feel... It was meant to make you feel uncomfortable and go, oh my god, that's the whole point. <clears throat> oh, let's see what our questions are. Is it really so implausible that a gay man could find love and happiness? 
Yeah, in 1960s Ireland? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, 1960s anywhere, absolutely. And if you did find it, you had to fucking hide it. Because it was illegal in a lot of places. According to Boyle's narrative, it just seems to be implausible. Basically impossible, and that's just not a storyline I'm willing to continue reading. Okay, I'll, you might not have gotten to the part, but he was very happy. He did find a relationship that he was, and he was absolutely in love, and had been with this partner, I think he was with that partner for 15 years, until something tragic and horrible happens. It's, it's also fiction as part of the story. But yeah, he was very happy and, and very in love for over 15 years. So obviously he didn't get to that part. So that answers your question, dumbass. Yes, it's possible. And he wrote it. Is it really plausible that every Catholic priest you meet is a pedophile? Not every, but there's a lot. I'm wondering if this person is Catholic. According to Boyle's narrative, it seems to be, and that's just not a storyline I'm willing to continue reading. I don't think there was any pedophiles, Catholic pedophiles in there. The Catholic priest that cast out his mom in the very beginning of the book wasn't a pedophile. He just had sex with adult women and had illegitimate children. That's not a pedophile. That just broke his vows of celibacy for the church. That's not a pedophile. Nowhere in there did it talk about Catholic priests molesting boys. Or children of any kind that I can remember. It, it, it's not. Like, the, the only Catholic priest to really touch on is the one that cast his mother out. And he had two children with adult women... Like, secretly, which is not allowed by the Catholic Church. So, again, she has no idea what the fuck she's talking about. And the conversation of the conversations of the boys, how unrealistic. I mean, seven-year-olds discussing perversion and sexual innuendos at a level I'm not sure some high school students think about. It's ridiculous, profane, and frankly, completely unbelievable. Not true. When they are seven, it was like play doctor, like, let's look at each other's penises, which a lot of kids at that age do because they're... Discovering their sexuality and discovering their bodies. Not uncommon. They didn't touch each other. They weren't jacking each other off or doing anything inappropriate sexually. It was like pretty much, I'll show you yours if you show me mine. It wasn't, it was age appropriate. So, and they weren't talking about sexual stuff. They were talking about like boobs, but most seven-year-olds think boobs are funny. It wasn't like talking about, oh, I'm going to go have sex with every person. I mean, I think Julian made a comment that when he gets older that he wants to be with a whole bunch of women, but it wasn't in the sexual connotation. So, again, wrong. Maybe slightly right by her part, but not really. Is it really plausible that all rich parents ignore their children and don't care? According to Boyle's narrative, it seems to be, and that's just not a story I'm willing to continue reading. Not true. Cyril's parents ignore him, yes, but they're also both really quirky and weird, and they provided for him, they just didn't give him the emotional support he needed. But Julian's family, they were very involved. His parents were very involved in his life, him and his sister's life, so... No, again, like, you... Read the fucking book! You have no... Like, that's what drives me nuts. Like, when I DNF a book, I don't write this big, long review. I might state why I DNF'd it, or what I didn't like, or why I didn't continue. But I'm not going to talk shit about the entire book, because I have no right to. I didn't finish the book. Now, if I finish the book, and I hated it, then yeah, I'll talk shit. But I'm not going to talk shit about the entire story when I haven't read the story. Um, this is the same author as The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, and the opening lines of this book were phenomenal. I was ready to make him, ready to make him a to-read author, but I just can't. I see what all the fuss is about for the writing itself. He weaves solid sentences and great plot structure, but this boorish and almost malicious approach to so many different aspects aspects of society is hard to ignore. Was there an agenda here? It sure seems to, or it sure seems so, and that's certainly every author's right, but as a reader, I don't have to punish myself as a result. There was no agenda. I mean, maybe a little bit, maybe to get across, like, how hard people who are gay or on the LBG, LBGTQIA plus spectrum have it or have had it, then yeah, that agenda should be written about because it's very important. And like, there was so much I got out of that book. Like she did not read far enough. Oh, yep. Here's another one. Nancy. Oh, could make it very far. Not past a seven-year-old Cyril and a seven-year-old friend having advanced sexual discussions on a level of those of adolescent age. Uh, well, I guess it was a little bit of a higher level, but it was Julian, not Cyril. Cyril had no idea what Julian was talking about. So to me, that shows that Julian was over-sexualized at a young age or had been exposed that happens. That happens in this day and age. But Cyril was clueless. He had no idea, like, what Cyril was talking about. So, with some sexual acts he mentioned. So, I mean, that, that, that's common. I mean, that happens in real life. So, okay. The friend's goal is to grow up to become a pervert. Okay, well, he didn't understand what the word pervert meant. Like, to him, the word pervert meant somebody who has a bunch of sex. He does. He didn't know that pervert meant somebody who, you know, in a negative connotation. So, 
when he said he wanted to grow up to be a pervert, he thought he was going meant growing up and being sexual with a whole bunch of women. So that's a seven-year-old misunderstanding an adult term. Again, common. Like, he, he's writing about two seven-year-olds in this chunk of the book. So again, that happens all the time. There's also the conversations between Cyril's adopted parents and him that are completely off-putting. Cyril's mother discussing the purity of the vagina with him, his father detailing the sexual encounter with his mother when they first met, and the endless topic of homosexuality discussed with him. Unbelievable rubbish. If any of you can find a seven-year-old with an equally mature and perverted seven-year-old friend <coughs> that are this advanced, I'll be happy to take this review down. Oh, McCartney says, painful. Basically hundreds of pages of poorly written dialogue. The first 30 pages are delightful, charming, and enchanting. The remaining 550 were a paint-by-number slog. No, it wasn't. Oh my fucking god. Oh, Amanda, let's see what Amanda has to say. I started out on the right foot, pulled me in with the story of the young girl that's been kicked out of church, her family, and her town because she's pregnant. Okay, yeah, we know all that. Um, I wasn't surprised by anything. She gives birth, gives him serial for adoption. We jump ahead seven years. This is when I started question reading the next 650 pages. I had so many issues, I kind of don't know where to begin. Okay, how about the way Cyril and Julian speak? They are seven. Okay, they're only seven for a chunk. Children don't speak like that, regardless of how many ridiculous reasons are given. Okay, when they're raised, Cyril was raised by these two people who pretty much treated him like a little adult, so it's plausible. Um... Why adopt a child you clearly don't want? Like, that's the whole point. They're, like, quirky people. Like, uh... Like, some people, like, don't have an open mind. <laughs> this book was so fucking fabulous. Like, I do not understand. Maude is a total predator. Kind of, but not really. Maude doesn't really do anything but hide in her office, chain smoke, and write her novels. So, okay. Um... There's also all of the coincidental situations. In fact, they all live in the building where Cyril was born or how many times Cyril runs into his birth mother. It's too often to be cute. Oh, she said she turned an LGBT character into caricature. Not true. I think Cyril is an amazing, amazing character. What Sass to say? DNF. I find it very difficult to DNF a book, but this one was a compelling DNF. Highly offensive and very corrosive to gaining a sympathetic platform. Because he spoke truth. Oh, another Eleanor was upset that Cyril was complaining about all the gay slurs he endured and all of the ch hardships he endured. Well, isn't that the point of a fucking fictional book? I can't read anymore. It's just pissing me off. Like, and I knew that one would be hard because of the subject matter that it was really going to bother me. And it does. So we're going to move on to my last one. So the last book I want to talk about is one of my favorite books ever. And I really need to reread it because I absolutely love it. And that's Savior's Champion by Jenna Moresi. I talk about this book all the time. It is probably going to be, what do they call that? Like, not your anchor book, but something like that where it's like the book your channel's known for. Everybody go read The Savior's Champion by Jenna Moresi. It's absolutely fucking amazing. And she is also an amazing person. Go read it. Um, yeah, I'm curious because this is self-published. So she published this herself, um, which sometimes can be... Um, a pain for some people like they don't like it I, I think her book is very brilliantly written I love the story I love the the romance because it takes a back seat to the the main story um it's just it's really good I really fucking love it I love the world she made I mean the only gripe that I could see people having is lack of world building she doesn't build the outside world very much that's coming in later novels this is supposed to be like a six book series she said that she thinks it's gonna be about six the next book is called The Savior's Sister, and it is The Savior's Champion told point from the point of view of the main female character in this story. Um, so it's like a different angle, but most of this is focused on Tobias, and it's about the characters and the Sovereign's Tournament, and it's just, it's very focused on that. You don't get much of the outside world or why the Savior is the only person with magic. I assume that's coming, so I can see that being a big gripe with this book, is the lack of world building. Um, but other than that... I don't see what else you can say about it. It is, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing fucking book. Now that I think about it, I need to buy this in hardcover. I don't mind my paperback that I got in my, um, the bookie box, but I kind of want a hardcover. But I prefer reading this one because it's like a floppy. It's a floppy paperback. Let's get into these one star reviews. All right, it's got 1,744 ratings and it's got an average rating of 4.04. .04. Go Jenna. Go Jenna, that's a great rating on Goodreads. Oh, she didn't, oh, there's only 63 one-star ratings, that's good. So she read Jenna's first self-published book called Eve the Awakening, and she thought this book would be an improvement. Book came out and looked at the title of the prologue at the beginning. This ain't gonna be a long review as I didn't finish the book. I'll just give it a short list of the pros and the cons. So the good, 
There was an editor this time, and from the improved pacing, not just proofreader, but an actual editor. It's a self-published book. I know she put a lot of effort into The Savior's Champion. No creepy victimization fantasies this time around. The names are diverse and unique. Um, some complained how random they are, which that's all their names. Um, she said, I don't mind the lack of world building too much either. I just sort of pictured this all in a whimsical fan fantasy land like Elle Enchanted or the Brandy version of Cinderella. No obviously toxic romance. True. I can't comment on how healthy, spoiler, spoiler, <laughs> she called Tobias Toe Jam. But I'm not going to mention the female love interest because that's spoiler. Or whatever his name is did their romance as I didn't finish the book, but at least it was nothing Twilight-esque. Very true. Um, laugh Out Loud comedy, which I also appreciate. Yes, that's true. See, cons. Hilarious scenes I mentioned above are actually meant to be serious. I don't think so. If you know Jenna Moresi at all, like if you watch her channel, she's fucking funny. Sorry if the angle changed, my phone cut off. Okay. So the cons, um, she said, like, I think these hilarious scenes I mentioned above are actually meant to be serious. I'm not going to talk about the funny scenes that she mentioned because they're kind of spoilery, but I don't think so. If you know Jenna Moresi at all, like if you watch her channel, She's just fucking sarcastic. She is sarcastic. She's loud. She swears like she... Mm. I think she re made them so that they were tongue-in-cheek. I think that was 100% on purpose. I don't think um, it was... She wasn't trying to be funny or, you know, like, or trying to be serious. She was trying to be funny. She was being tongue-in-cheek. She was being sarcastic. That's Jenna. <laughs> like, that's just how she is. Um, oh, saying the characters are flat, didn't react to their deaths. Yeah, I can see that. There's like 12 people, I think. I think it's 12, maybe 14. 12, no. I think it's in groups of four. I can't remember. It's it's high. It's over 10. I think it's like 12 to 16 people who enter the labyrinth. And so some of them that die early are throwaway characters that you know that she didn't develop because, and we didn't really care about them because they died really quick. But the other ones she spends more time on and develops. Like, there's character development. It's there. Um... Yeah, it's just more characters are flat. I'm not the book's target audience. Who do you think it's for? It's not for young adults. This is an adult book. Savior's Champion is 100% for adults. It's full of violence and gore, and there's some sex in it. There's full of foul language. Like, it is not for teens. It is for adults. Jenna has said that multiple times. Um, visually empty. The only thing the author describes in much detail are the characters. Okay, I can get that to a degree. She doesn't do a lot of world building outside the labyrinth, but I think inside the labyrinth and, like, the tasks and stuff that happen in there, she's very, they are described very well and in a lot of detail. I think the only thing she does, doesn't describe is the outside part, which, that's fine. They don't spend much time outside of it, and that part of the world building, I think, will happen later. So, okay, you're wrong, though. She does describe the inside of the labyrinth very well. I could see it very well in my head. And that's the whole point. If you're reading a book, you should be able to visualize it. And I could visualize it just perfect. So you're wrong. Um, but you also didn't finish it. So you can't really fucking say shit yet again. Bland swearing. Um, I'm fine with unrealistically excessive swearing if it's supposed to be over the top. In which case I shouldn't... It shouldn't just be the same bad words over and over, but creative comical concoctions of vulgarity. You could have been like, your highness was sword-wielding heroes bellowing hilariously poetic profanities, but the swearing wasn't funny, nor did it create any believable tension. I don't think she added the swearing, like, to be, like, funny or create tension. These people just, that's just their regular speaking, like, just how they talk. I say fuck almost every other word in my everyday life. Like, I don't keep it off my channel. I always swear a lot. Um, so for me, like, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, like... She wasn't saying, like, fuck and, like, that kind of stuff. It was just normal swearing. She wasn't making up weird swear words. It was... She just made her characters talk like she talks. A lot of authors do that. It's pretty common. The twist ending um, is obvious. Oh, no, I didn't finish the book, but the twist is now common knowledge as much as Edward turning out to be a vampire. Did the twist surprise me? No. And like I said in my review of this book, or I think I talked about it in my top books of, of 2018, I think the twist is made easy to figure out on purpose. I think Jenna wants you to figure out what the, the twist or the reveal is. I think she wants you to know because it's kind of like one of those instances 
where the reader knows, but you're waiting for the main character to find out. Like, we know something he doesn't know, and we're just like, oh my god, figure it out, figure it out. And, you know, you're waiting for him to figure it out. I think that's what she intended. I don't think she intended it to be this, oh my god, big reveal, shock, oh. Because it, it wasn't written that way. Like, the way it's... You're supposed to know. You're supposed to know before Tobias does. It, it, that's the whole point of the book. Or the point of that, the twist. Like, you're supposed to know ahead of time. For me, it created more tension for me because it's like, I wanted him to hurry up and find out. And there's so many hints that are dropped to him and it just goes right over his head. And it's like, you're just waiting for it, wait for it, wait for it. And eventually he figures it out. But it takes him a while. And it was more, I build more tension for the reader, I think, more than anything else. It was... Um, and I've asked Jenna, I just can't remember her answer. I think I asked her, did you expect us to figure out, spoiler, 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 before your main character did, like, was, were, did you mean for that or did you mean it for it to be a surprise? And I can't remember her exact answer. I'll ask her again because I believe she said we were meant to find out and like, and some of it's based on interpretation too and every, every reader is different and I'm going off on a tangent. I need to stop now. Same fake spot results, same issues of reviews that reek of woolly fabric and plastic googly eyes. What? Okay, that doesn't make any sense. The chapter titles, chapters don't need titles, and prologues definitely don't need titles. I personally like title chapters, but only if it's an actual title. Okay, so you say that chapters don't need titles, but then you say you like chapters with titles. Well, which is it? I don't care either way. Sometimes I love, it just depends on the book. Like, I really don't care. And I don't even remember, like, just how she titles her chapters. Yeah, they title, like, what's coming up next. Some of them are titled by characters. Um, some of them are by, like, what the next task is. But, yeah, like, it's all... It's relevant. It kind of gives you a sneak peek of what's coming. Like, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm not... She said... She's just talking shit more about the chapters and then says, well, I'm not in the target age group. <sighs> Let's see. How... How old is this person? Like... Because you probably are in the target age group. You're just an idiot. It's meant for adults. Huh. And she's a slow-moving, aspiring novelist planning to self-publish. Pre-beta revisions are taking longer than expected. So you're trying to get your own self-published book out there and you're talking trash about somebody else's. That's cool. And it seems like she's a harsh rater looking at some of the other books she's rated. She rates very harshly. So it's just another tropey YA novel. Except for it's not a YA novel, and it's not very tropey. I mean, there are some tropes, but every YA novel has tropes. She just picked her favorite ones. Um, the tropes that it doesn't have that makes me happy, it does not have a love triangle. It does not have a toxic relationship. It does not have insta-love. All stuff that I fucking hate does not have. That makes me happier than other things. Oh, look at this. I was trying to understand all the five-star glowing reviews for this and found out the author has a platform on YouTube, and then I understood not necessarily true. Like, if you watch somebody on YouTube, like, there's a lot of YouTubers and booktubers who are coming out with books, and I guess now Jen is considered, like, an author tuber more than a booktuber. But still, they're all coming out with books. Like, there was another person I'm not going to mention who just released a book, and all the booktubers are reading it are not giving it good reviews. So it's not... It's not that. It's not that's because she's on YouTube. I mean, it might help for some people who just go on to Goodreads and hit five stars, five stars, who aren't haven't actually read it. But if you actually read the five star reviews, it's from people who have actually fucking read it and loved it. Needed to fix the lazy editing in terms of world building, dialogue, character dimension, and either the removal of modern terms and slang or the information that this was set in modern times in an alternate universe. Oh, and then that other person I just read from Liz commented on this review and said, for an even better understanding of the five-star reviews, visit a website called Fake Spot. <laughs> and then somebody else goes, Liz, I'm not sure what you're referring to. I just tried it because I was curious, and Fake Spot gives this book a 90% rating for high-quality reviews. <laughs> so that means that it's not full of fake reviews. Oh, this bitch. Oh, maybe this. And then she goes, oh, well, before Jenna Moresi's books were the only ones on that site that had red alerts that were self-published, then maybe they have glitches. Oh, they don't have glitches. People just generally like the book, dumbass. Okay, so this person, Sarabas. Rundown of the bad. Stakes are laughably low, even most so after the big plot twist. I think the stakes are high. It's just one of those ones where you know that Tobias is going to survive the whole thing. So it's like, there is no fear that he's going to die because you know he's going to make it. I mean, there's that. So I guess the stakes are kind of low, but it's not laughably low. And again, I think you are, be you are meant to know the twist. 
the romance is an insta-love between Mr. and Mrs. Sue. Not true. It's not an insta-love. It's not... The female love interest is not a Mary Sue. It's something completely different, and I'm not going to say anything because of spoilers. Um, and I wouldn't call him a Mr. Mary Sue because he's not... He's not like... He doesn't have all this talent. I mean, he is physically strong, but he also works in the field, so he has a good physique anyways, for one. But there's a lot of tasks in the labyrinth that he doesn't do well at, that he either fails completely or almost dies doing it. So it's not that he magically knows everything or is like best at everything. I mean, that's not true at all. Um, so wrong. There's no world building none despite how long the book is. Like I said, I addressed that the world building outside is very small and I think she's addressed it a couple of times. So, I mean, I will give it that. Characters are caricatures, protagonist and villain included. Maybe the villain is a caricature, the protagonist and the other characters, no. I liked all the characters. I became really attached to them, the ones that I liked. Um, but the villains, not so much. Um, so many characters, but only a handful matters. Kind of. But all the ones that don't matter are killed off pretty quick. The magic is not explained enough to seem real and is too central of a theme to get a pass by pulling the soft magic system card. I think it's going to be explained more in The Savior Sister because that is from the female perspective and the same book female perspective you have to remember the savior's champion is 100 percent from tobias's point of view and he spends 90 percent of the book underground in a labyrinth in this competition so it's really hard to explain the magic system when he isn't a magical person so i think the next book will have way more world building and way more backstory of the savior and how why she is the only one with power and stuff like that i think the next book is going to have way more and answer all the questions but I need to stop now because I'm starting to get really pissed off and getting really defensive and yeah I hope you guys enjoyed me reading one star books or uh, one star reviews of my five star favorite books um it was a struggle um it was really hard to do it some of it made me angry because I just can't stand when people dnf books and then give it one star ratings and write this big long review on the 40 pages they read you have no right to fucking talk shut your mouth. So I don't know if this was a good idea doing this. I did enjoy doing it. It was kind of fun to see what other people had to say that was complete and wrong bullshit because they don't know what they're talking about. Your opinions are stupid. That's me being a petty bitch because everybody's entitled to their wrong opinions. It's fine. Please let me know in the comments below um, what you thought of these books. If you've read them, are you one of the one star reviewers? Um, is there anything else like this you'd like me to do? Like I could read five star reviews of my least favorite books. That would be kind of fun. Don't know. We'll see. But anyways, guys, that's it. Like, subscribe, all the good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.